Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shah Osha, and I am a professor of visual studies and um, at Evergreen. And um, I want to welcome you to the last our lecture of the 22-23 school year. Um, and I really want to extend a deep thank you to uh, Raul Berman, Dave Crampton, and uh, the media interns who have helped to give provide important tech support and record and post these wonderful lectures. <clears throat> Today we have um, our beloved uh, Lusat Petsanis, um, who is um, a professor here at Evergreen, um, and has curated an exhibition that will be um, happening in Vienna. And she has brought together three of the artists in that show who will be joining us, uh, Charles Edward Williams, uh, Keone Wright, and Ikner Demer uh, Koparan. My pronunciation is not great for that. But um, anyway, we have um, Saz Jackson here to a student to introduce them. Thank you, Saz. Hello, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Saz Jackson. I'm a student here at Evergreen. I'm currently in the Writing Visual Culture, the Image in Cultural and Critical, Critical Theory program that's headed by Professor Kathleen Amen and Professor Vuslat Katsanis. So today I'm so fortunate and honored to introduce the panelists, uh, founders and artists involved in MPAC. Um, one of them being my longtime professor, Vuslat Katsanis. Uh, Katsanis is a scholar of comparative literature, film, and visual culture with a research focus on post-1989 Turkish and global migrant cultural practices. Currently a professor of literary arts and studies at Evergreen. Um, and also uh, in my own personal experience, a masterful curator of creativity and community, her ability to put together curriculums and collections of uh, culturally unique works of visual art and literature uh, are amazing. Her, uh, her efforts to spread the message of global ethics through the academic system has been a major accomplishment of decentralization and decolonization awareness that will have and has already had far reaching impacts beyond just the academic and the theoretical. Uh, and then you'll be hearing from Kayani K. Wright, who is a Suriname based experimental filmmaker, documentarian, visual artist. Uh, his latest documentary, A Posse for Romeo, uh, won an official selection of eight film festivals, uh, was in an uh, official selection of eight film festivals to include LA's Pan African Film Festival and the Toronto Black Film Festival. Uh, he himself is the inaugural recipient uh, for the Common Good Platform Artist Residency. C, Narima Trinidad and Tobago, U.S. Navy veteran, holds a BA in mass communications from Boston's Emanuel College, and he's also a testicular cancer survivor, so it makes noise, survivor vibes, love that. Um, yeah, uh, his films, uh, Aposi Romeo, for instance, um, include themes of post-war cultural evolution, trauma, myth, um, the spectrum between science and the supernatural, the, the boundaries of reality and the human condition. Um, and I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you more about his own art. I had some more, but this is get running long. So I'm gonna go on next to uh, Ilknor Dimir Koparan, uh, Turkish born American artist and co-founder of MPAC. Um, she, uh, multimedia works, including painting, sculpture, installation, performance, digital media, um, themes of fragments and identity, displacement, temporality, uh, translation and transmutation, and even immortality. Uh, her I Want to Live Forever series blends the abstract with the symmetrical, and while it's beautifully seeped in cultural significance, it also invites the viewer to gaze into a striking fragmented void um, where there's a symbiotic interaction at play um, and a, a really haunting and peaceful vision of the past, present, and future all at once. Um, and then you'll be hearing from Charles Edward Williams, who is a contemporary visual artist from South Carolina. He holds a BFA from Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia and has an MFA from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Um, so uh, yeah, he'll be sharing some of his paintings. Um, I've, I've heard him speak, seen his paintings, his paintings, Night and a Swim in particular, deal with these themes of like, 
identity again, intergenerational trauma, survival, guilt, grief, man versus nature, man versus environment, um, and uh, the, the cognitive dissonance of a, of a fragmented existence. So um, all of these Avengers assemble to create MPAC, which stands for Min Ishri of Post-Collapse Art and Culture, um, their exhibition is going to open June uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, titled Play. So I'm going to put the links in the chat, and Vuslot is going to take it away now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saz, for that amazing, beautiful introduction. Um, what an honor to be here, and thank you to Professor Shaw Osha and to Kathleen Eamon and to all of the tech support for having us and making space for us um, today. It's a real honor. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you don't just look at my big head, but my wise instead. Hopefully this is working. Um, and the way we timed it is that we would each have about 15 minutes um, to do a little segment because it's a panel we want to leave enough room for Q&A at the end. Um, so uh what i'd like to do is first of all i'd like to kind of give you an introduction um to what my work has been about how i got to think about what i think about what i do and then then, then um transition to talking about ministry of post collapse art and culture which is MPAC for for short um but before i do that just a brief kind of anecdote on um an anecdote about about a time that was for me a pivotal moment in in, in my kind of thinking about um, the path that eventually became my area of focus in my academic studies and and creative work, and that's when I was um, in the third grade and my mother and my sister um, accidentally ended up being immigrants in the United States, and I remember it was the small town in Oklahoma. I, I was in elementary school. And this uh, fifth grader came to me and he asked me, what are you? And I thought, you know, I'm still learning the English language. Um, so I think he made a grammatical mistake because what refers to inanimate objects. So processing this information, translating in my head, I thought that he probably wanted to know all of those inanimate qualities about myself. So I listed my age, my height, my weight, and he was unsatisfied. So he said, well, what are you? And then I corrected him this time because, you know, I was a good student. I said, who are you? So he said his name and I didn't know what else to respond. And I thought, well, this guy is, you know, an expert in English. I don't think I understand him. So I'm just going to walk away. So it was like, you know, years later, I, I, I understood that um, this curious, you know, fifth grader um, who saw me in this like small town, Oklahoma, was actually trying to identify me by my racial or ethnic or national identity, something of that sort. Um, and so that kind of really stuck with me in terms of um, our perceived differences, how we see ourselves and how we see each other, and how oftentimes when we talk about who we are, we actually talk about those um, aspects of our identity that come to represent um, who we are, right? So then I, of course, learned to identify myself uh, through my national identity. I started saying I'm a Turk. And then later, of course, this relationship to the homeland became so severed um, that I identified as a Turkish American. And then, of course, you know, um, throughout my undergrad studies, studying studio arts and studying literature, I became exposed to work that similarly dealt with uh, questions of identity and difference, um, you know, the whole question of the cultural other or the political other. Um, and I became very, very drawn to um, immigrant um, literature and diasporic cinema. So when I went and got my master's in visual studies, which is this interdisciplinary area of studies between art history, art theory, and film and media studies, I became fascinated by the cinema of Fatih Akın, who's a German-Turkish diasporic filmmaker. And I started to write about um, some of his films in the way that he talks about this diasporic condition as a way of you know, searching for a space of belonging, a, sp a, a place to fit, um, but never really finding it and kind of you know, ending on this turn to the sea as you know, body of, without borders um, and kind of the fluidity. Um, and then I started to wonder, well, what's happening in the cinemas from 
Turkey, not the diasporic uh, and the migrant, but the national cinemas, the new cinemas from Turkey. And I noticed that there's even without the physical movement out of the country, this the sense of not belonging, the 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 out of placeness, and the kind of overall disappointment with the national cultural landscape was still there. So of course, aesthetically, it's a bit darker and more more dim. But I noticed that um, questions of identity and difference are still still remain there. And how cinema communicates this aesthetically cinematography wise um, became really interesting to me. So I, I wrote a chapter on Nuri Bilge Ceylan's Three Monkeys. And then I was reinvited to like update that um, essay and republish it for that's coming up now in Edinburgh University Press. And I'm and I'm seeing this um, really interesting sort of resistance to a kind of a sociopolitical landscape but communicated through what I call the aesthetic silences and through the kind of the discrepancy between what you see and what you hear. So the image and the sound don't quite hold. There's always this kind of a disconnect. Um, and of course I did some literary translation uh, and I looked at the work of Tarek Dursunka, who is a writer from my hometown from Izmir. And his writing is looking at the, um. This is my son. His writing is looking at um, this particular story is looking at a moment in Taksim Square, which is the main public square um, in Istanbul. Um, there's also a site where people kind of come together, get together. And he's writing about the era of like a, how the World War II affected the sorry, this is how I usually work with my child, how World War II affected social life in Turkey. So the moment of Taksim Square is very important. I, I apologize, one second. Um, and that led me to think about how Taksim Square, can you please get them? Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. This is the pandemic era remnants of parenting and working at the same time. I apologize. So um, how, how Toxin Square still continues to be this kind of gathering area for different communities and different kind of political voices that are speaking together collectively and collaboratively. So this particular image of, is of the Atatürk Cultural Center. Um, that was the, the original building that's since been demolished and then reconstructed. Um, but during the Gezi uprising in 2013, and you can see the poster signs of the various different um, grassroots activists, political um, signs, um, leftist signs and workers, student signs. Like, and, and also what's interesting is like some of these groups that seem to not get along right are all sort of like um, joining together in a, in a critique of the increasing authoritarianism in the country. So based on this work, um, I'm I'm also interested not only the sense of kind of displacement and home seeking a space to belong and a space to carve out with um, through through the things that disappoint us right you saw aesthetically in cinematography is quite depressing. I noticed with the Geza uprising in 2013, humor and play is a huge part of the social resistance. So if these are some images I found online um, during the 2013 uprising. And the caption, the, the graffiti here says, um, alcohol might have been banned, but people have become sober. Um, this is a, again, graffiti on the ground. Um, that's a play on the words, like the more you squeeze, the bigger it gets. And of course, it's in reference to the police who was squeezing on the trigger, the tear gas very close up to this um, woman's face. The woman in red became a symbol of the resistance. And the protesters who um, wore these penguin masks because while there were thousands of protesters on the streets, uh, all of the channels and the TV played a documentary about the penguins. And um, the word chapel, which means riffraff, which is what the president called the protesters, um, became a big part of the slogan. So every day I chapel, I chapel, therefore I am. Chapel means riffraff. So we played with this word in 2013, right at the time in May and, and June in Santa Monica, we had a 
we curated our first um, kind of an exhibition reading call to action type of a, a work in, in Los Angeles, which we call Chapul LA or Chapul La, which is a word play in Turkish means come on and be a riffraff. Um, and here we're reading um, excerpts from Nazem Hikmet Ran's um, landscapes from human landscapes from my home country in, in the English and the Turkish and the French. And this is the community that came out to offer their support. So I'm going to skip a little bit of my, my work that leads up to it. But since, since uh, Chapula in 2013 um, and various different kind of collaborative and curatorial projects, it led us to rethink again our relationship, identity, and difference to our homelands and to our adopted lands. And this kind of general sense of disconnection and disappointment. Uh, and we wrote a we we decided to write a book on post-collapse art and theory, but first we wrote a manifesto and released it at the Zero Future Climate Justice um, event happening at the Yorcha Park in Istanbul. And the Turkish translation was actually by one of the most famous curators in Turkey. And um, we released this in 2019, and then a couple of years later launched the brick and mortar exhibition space and gallery in Portland. So really what post-collapse art and culture is interested in is looking at the human experiences, looking at the stories um, who similarly, you know, people who found themselves migrating or, or who, who lost their homelands, lost their language, their passport, their currency, and, and try to carve out new spaces of belonging, try to rebuild their lives from zero. And even if um, you don't leave anywhere, you're right where you are, having that migrant experience, the kind of the psychic life of collapse um, is what we're interested in. So um, since opening up the space in 2021, we uh, curated five exhibitions, including uh, painting and um, etching and video. Um, we have the pleasure of, you know, collaborating with many artists from all around the world. Uh, we used the word East to signal the global Easts, but we're in, in communication from the global Easts, the global Souths is what we're calling. Um, and uh, we did several curatorial talks and interviews and some of our publications are online now. Our first open call was for 1989, which is the year of revolution since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Um, and to this open call, we were very honored to see a huge outpouring of support and projects from South America to Hong Kong to Iran to, to Suriname and uh, um, from Czech Republic, uh, Swiss, Switzerland and Germany. And so I'm gonna just show you briefly the um, Inter the, the gallery view of the first iteration of 1989. This is by an artist from Russia, Comrade Cha is a hand embroidered and hand etched um, uh, visual work about the uh, her childhood um, TV character. And of course, I'll let Kiani talk about his work, um, a video still from his film, Suriname Veteran. Um, an artist who actually took oral histories from people who experienced the reunification of Germany, East and West, and an artist who actually um, experienced escaping um, from the Berlin Wall to the other side. And these are hand-drawn illustrations on um, just very basic paper. Again, Czech artist who, um, this is graphite, line by line by line, very labor intensive, meticulously constructed illustration with the pin needle etching of the names of the victims who uh, did not survive crossing the border from the, the Czech, Czechoslovakia. And another Czech American immigrant artist whose material deals with homelessness and, and poverty and how the poor are often seen as the social monsters. Um, and Charles Edward Williams, who's a part of this panel today, who also actually reached out to us on his own after seeing some of our Instagram. And uh, it was really interesting to say for, for him to say that our work um, from the vantage of the immigrants and diasporic of the global Easts, right, is, is really resonating with his work on the current and, and past as well, um, racial violence and the escalating violence that he sees occurring in the U.S., 
and um, Stas Orlovsky from uh, Moldova. Um, this is a sculptural work that is with a video projection. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a really interesting um, film by Kate Walker. It's a it's a gay bar somewhere in the Midwest where people are getting together and singing. It's the end of the world, and I feel fine. Right, speaking about play and joy, and you witnessed uh, music habitat arts um, collaborative like meditations on on um, environment. Hong Kong artist who writes about 1989 in the context of China and Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square. And of course, Hong Kong's relationship with mainland China, um, a Turkish artist for whom the 2000s is already a time to be nostalgic about, uh, Iranian artist whose artist statement was, I wish to change nothing, right? So speaking in code a little bit, um, Sylvia Armani, Amanchi and Bogdan Armanu from Romania, who's contemplating uh, the national communist past, and a Polish artist, Masiek Shtep, Nevsky, whose like hand illustrated animation about solitude is reflecting on the, the now, the present. And so what I wish to say is we founded MPAC Ministry of post collapse Art and Culture really to try to centralize the um, experiences and the human stories uh, that are born out of initial displacements and difference misunderstood. Uh, not as the others of art and art history, but as central to understanding and defining our contemporary reality, um, but also because of our shared insistence on living this life joyfully and peacefully and trusting one another through collaboration and, and, and collective work. Um, so our next iteration is in Zurich, opening this June in on, on the theme of play, which we will do for the whole year. Thank you. I will now hand it to Kiani. I apologize, my timer didn't work. My kid photobombed me, but I hope I didn't eat up too much of your time. Thank you. No, 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 it's all good. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the tech crew. Um, if we could bring up my slides, please. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Yes, here we go. It's all play. Um, and thank you, Vuslat, for your, your presentation and your description of everything that you do. It's tough to squeeze into 15 minutes. I think my focus will mostly be on the show in Zurich and then just sort of introducing myself to everybody and what, what it's all about. And really what it's all about is play, quite literally. Um, I do use the term work when I talk about the things that I create, but eh, that's just me kowtowing to society a little bit because to me, it's not work. It is all play. Um, I'm a 41 year old man who's constantly playing and that's what I do. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just for orientation's sake, I am currently in a country called Suriname. Suriname is on the East coast of South America or what some people call the Caribbean coast. Um, I've been coming here since 2017, and although I've always been a creative and always considered myself an artist, I think Suriname is where I kind of really gave in to my creativity, and I was highly inspired by a lot of the things that I saw here, a lot of the history that um, I learned about, the cultures that reside here. Um, it is a cultural utopia, I like to call it. There are uh, Javanese neighborhoods here. There are Hindustani or East Indian neighborhoods here. There are afro surinamese Creole, Chinese, uh, Japanese. You have Brazilians, you have Venezuelans. It is such a finely woven quilt of cultures. Um, and it's difficult not to be inspired in a place like this. And before anybody, just as if you're wondering before anybody, one of my pet peeves is the word backpacker. I was not a backpacker. I'm not a backpacker. Uh, when I travel the earth, I like to really try my best to integrate myself into places and communities. Um, I don't know how I feel about the term participant observer. That seems a little bit weird. Uh, I would just say that I, I just try to live amongst the people in a place. I don't go by tours. I don't, uh, you know, do all the touristy things. And I don't actually don't even carry a backpack. So it would be inappropriate to call me a backpacker. Um, 
But in 2017, I visited Suriname for the first place. And in 2018, I decided I was going to stay for a much extended period of time, much longer extended period of time. Um, and I would say over the last six years, I have probably spent a total of three and a half actually residing in Suriname. When I'm not here, I'm in Brooklyn or I'm in Hawaii or I'm just I'm just hustling. Um, but on top of all the beautiful cultures that reside in Suriname, um, this is also the greenest place on earth. 94% of the country is covered in rainforest. Therefore, it is also home to some of the most exotic animals on earth. Um, if we go to the next slide, it is also home to the green anaconda, which is the focus of the first film that I have, or video, I should say, that's included in um, the exhibition that we're doing in Switzerland. It is a short video, experimental video called Aboma Aboma. And Aboma is the Surinamese word for anaconda. And in the film, I follow four gentlemen, three of which are pictured here, um, as we search for the elusive anaconda for the sake of conservation. And if we go to the next slide, and there is a picture, a screenshot from my film of a green anaconda doing its thing. Um, so much metaphor here, really, because the anaconda, as many of you know, for those of you that have seen the beautiful piece of cinematic work that stars Ice Cube and Jennifer Lopez uh, in the film entitled Anaconda, um, the anaconda is very much misunderstood. Uh, and when I come to Suriname, actually, what is the response I get from most people who not only live here, but people in the United States um, who hear that I'm coming to this third world country that is the smallest country in South America, the poorest country in South America. And then they like to rattle off a whole bunch of geopolitical facts that really have nothing to do with what I'm doing here. Things about crime, things about uh, topics such as money laundering, drugs, transshipment points, um, that sort of thing. And I, uh, corruption mainly also. And I like to tell people, I'm usually, believe it or not, when I come to a place like Suriname, the president usually doesn't call me, yeah, to come and make decisions. Um, and even some people here in Suriname are surprised that, it, that an American would want to come here. But again, it's this idea of stereotypes even fueling the way that we look at ourselves sometimes. And I find that with the anaconda because my experiences with them, and by the way, they're everywhere in Suriname, uh, it's difficult to call the city I live in a city uh, because it is so green. It represents maybe more of a somewhat developed uh, dusty jungle town than an actual city. But during the rainy season, you see these guys all over the place. Um, it's not uncommon. Um, but again, there is this stereotype. So we find in Suriname that people shoot them and people will kill them. Um, and yeah, so I see some deep metaphor there, but they're such docile animals, such docile animals. If you go to the next screen, please. The film or the video, I should say, mostly centers around this gentleman, Stevo Suriname. And this is kind of, this, this shot represents sort of the vantage point that a lot of the shots in the film are taken from. Um, it's me, my camera guy, and the four conservationists and Bushmen uh, you could also call them wild boys. I think they wouldn't, I don't think they would mind that, but we're just in this small little dinghy or punt, whatever you might want to call it. And we're on this Surinamese waterway searching for these animals over the course of one day and one night. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. And along the way, we see a lot of different, uh, different animals. Um, and I try in the film and Thanks to the editor. Um, I direct all my edits, uh, but I worked with an editor who really our visions aligned. And so we were able to take these shots of all the different wildlife that we saw on this trip. And we kind of um, added an Alfred Hitchcock element with the black and white. And we did a lot of overlays as well. So throughout the film, as we're searching for the anacondas, you're also encountering all of these different animals as well. And really the film is the antithesis of a lot of the nature documentaries that you might see out there. There's no stuffy European men in khaki suits who are all you know, trying to take this seriously and dramatic music. 
everybody, including myself, were all enjoying the moment. And quite frankly, it really wasn't even about finding the anaconda. It was about experiencing nature, you know? So it wasn't this idea of the hunt. It was like, hopefully we encounter an anaconda. That would be awesome. That's kind of the goal. But what a beautiful blessing to be out on this waterway day and night. And just, you have scenes like this where you have uh, um, the caiman that come up to the boat or you have lizards or birds. And just, yeah, so I, I over the course of the um, short montage that sort of makes up the majority of the film and it's set to music, you also encounter these animals, but we also add a little bit of, uh, an artistic creative touch to the way that we edit as well. Um, but again, definitely the theme of play comes forward. You know, we're not on the hunt for the monster of the Amazon. We're, we're just hoping that we see a snake that's actually quite docile and beautiful um, and comes with a lot of reverence uh, or people I should say in Suriname have a lot of reverence for the animal. Those, even people who might, uh, might, hold on tightly to the stereotype that comes with the animal. If you look within Surinamese culture, there's actually a lot of reverence for anacondas or abomas. Um, they are considered the queen of the Amazon. And, and that idea kind of stretches outside of Suriname to Guyana, to Venezuela, all the way across to Peru as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, we find one, spoiler alert. Um, this guy was crossing a road and part of what these gentlemen do, what Steve-O does is they're looking, you know, if they see an animal that's in a place that's probably, probably not good, like a neighborhood, um, or a roadway, um, then it's important that they'll, they'll bag it up and they'll bring it to a place where it can survive and it can live. And so this is kind of the closing stanza of the film where he emerges from the jungle with, uh, with the anaconda and, Really, I mean, he gives the whole interview at this point of the film with the snake around his neck. So, um, yeah, so it, it, it totally undoes any idea that these are like aggressive animals, you know, and you don't have to just be a snake expert to be able to uh, experience just how docile these animals are. All right, next slide. And the second film in play, let me just check my time real quick. Ooh. Um, so the second film is mostly a metaphoric ride to the, the main streets and back roads of Brooklyn. And it has a lot to do with my experience having testicular cancer or actually coming out of different treatments and surgeries, namely the surgery that took my left testicle. And I was inspired by these guys who ride around Brooklyn on their dirt bikes uh, at, at all hours of the day, throughout the week, on the weekend. And they're all, always riding on one wheel. They're always popping a wheelie. And I saw, you know, an opportunity there to kind of juxtapose my experience going from two testicles to one, from going from two wheels to one. Um, this is uh, about a two minute and 30 second film, uh, short video. And again, it's experimental. Uh, I'm the narrator. And, and yeah, uh, if we go to the next slide, I just use some different visuals to not necessarily tell the audience what I've been through, but to maybe, um, yeah, sort of let them know maybe what I've been through without actually saying it, you know? So here we see, I've got two lemons on a Brooklyn sidewalk and I'm taking one away. Um, and then there are other shots that I use, you know, I use uh, an, a mannequin leg that's hung upside down um, to sort of show like where I was in my life at the time. I very much felt like I was being just dangled in the air upside down and tied up and unable to really figure out what all of this meant. And it was of course, much more than losing a piece of my body or a piece of my anatomy. Um, and I wouldn't even say that for me personally, it was about, uh, you know, uh, anything having to do with identity per se, but going from diagnosis to losing my testicle, chemo, and very invasive surgeries over the course of a year. Um, sure, I was cancer free, but I often wondered like, was I? Because I still felt like I was suffering from some sort of, um, some sort of ailment, you know, which was definitely uh, not so much physical, but we'll say metaphysical 
and spiritual as well as I tried to find that balance again. Next slide, please. And again, this is uh, the young gentleman in Brooklyn who is the focus of the film doing his thing. It's not an uncommon sight to see uh, in the, the uh, main streets and back roads of Brooklyn. Next slide. And this is the film that uh, I've probably, this is not part of play, but this is the film that uh, represents my first foray into like actual, uh, I hesitate to use the word mainstream, but um, documentary filmmaking, making a film called The Posse for Romeo about Suriname's Civil War, which uh, was from 1986 until 1992. So very much fresh in the minds of people in Suriname, but not necessarily anywhere in the purview of people outside of Suriname. So through this film and by telling the story of a, a, of a maroon foot soldier from the interior of Suriname, I was, I'm able to take that story, which is a very Suriname story, and bring it to audiences um, on foreign shores. Next slide. And here I am at play, being an independent filmmaker, I do everything. Uh, I do often work with a camera slash editor person, um, but I direct the edits, I direct the films, I write the films, writing is the basis for everything I do. And, and when I look at these photos, I just see play. I'm just at play. A lot of times I don't even know what I'm doing. Like I'm holding that boom and it's like, I hope I'm doing this right. Uh, next slide. And again, uh, doing interviews, cross-referencing notes. Um, and if you want an idea of how joyful it is or how much enjoyment you can get from working from or with me, I should say, go to the next slide, please. That's the face of someone who's having a great time, for sure. <laughs> but it is, it is all play. Um, next slide, please. I am also a wire bender which might be something that not too many people are familiar with, but I make wire sculptures. I just did a six week residency in Trinidad where the focus, I think that the NGO that had me out to Trinidad to do the residency, they were like, hey, we're having this documentary filmmaker come. And then I showed up and I just wanted to make wire sculptures, but they were still very impressed and very happy. And I was able to do a solo show just about a month ago where I really put the wire work um, uh, out for people to see, not just Instagram posts or you know social media posts and whatnot, but now my secret is out. I am a wire bender. Um, next slide, we'll just take a look at a little bit of my work. Again, yeah, yep, yeah. next slide, good. Yes, yep. Yeah. And we can, we can just hold right there. Yeah, so in closing, it is all play. It is all play. And I think this photo in particular is important, you know, um, and, and I'll finish up by just saying that, first of all, I'm spray painting outside because I don't have a studio that's conducive for spray painting. Um, but to have these sort of public displays of art, it's not for the sake of my ego, especially in a place like Suriname um, that is struggling in so many ways. It is important for people to see others involved in creating. Um, I truly believe that the issues that Suriname has and the issues that a lot of places that I go to have uh, can be solved and managed by giving into the arts and paying attention to the arts and using the arts as a vehicle, not just for activism, but for also giving people opportunities. And what I find surprisingly, even in Trinidad is whether it's, we're talking about political issues or we're talking about um, just the way the education system is set up where it's, it's very it's strict and narrow. Um, and you're looking at a place with like depreciating value of money, uh, people, tend to turn away from the arts because they feel like, well, we don't have the money to do that or we have too many problems to do that. Um, when really, I think we need to be rearing and expanding the imaginations of, of children and adults so that they can live a creative life. And that's one of the things I try to tell people as I move about the earth. And I'm just one of many very talented artists. There are many Surinamese artists that are so much talented than I am 
and should be in shows in Zurich and whatnot. And it's my hope to actually be a little bit of a vehicle for those individuals to get out there. Uh, the other thing I find in countries like Suriname is that it's, you know, it's difficult to get your work out because you don't have the kind of money that you need um, to even apply for a program or to answer an open call that might have a fee or do a film festival. So um, anyways, that's me. That's how I play. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. So it's my turn. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Yes. No. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Sorry about that. So I'm going to share my screen now. And um, going to share, but of course I'm like all the way. And then. Sorry, I'm just going to have to figure this out with um, presenter view. But do you also see my um, notes when I do this? Does it cover your screen? No, it looks good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Just trying to move that down. I can. This It's in my way. All right. Well, it's going to have to be that way. So. Um, Hello Evergreen. <laughs> I didn't know how to title it. So I'm going to uh, talk about some of the works that I have in the upcoming show that we have in Zurich. So this is a piece that will be included from my work. And uh, this also will be included in there. And this also will be included. So. But before I talk about like what these are all about and how it even relates to everything, I have to go back and talk about my early work. And so it all started with me trying to understand the purpose of the terrible trick trope in the Western imaginary. And the reason why I say it is because it's like growing up, I was always exposed to the the terrible tro trope you know it's in this film haunted me growing up everybody always asked about it it's in this like painting it's it was in the terminator that was uh appeared as the original ai named the turk which then evolved into killer robots that hated uh, humanity which was a throwback to this guy the original mechanical Turk that was made by an Austrian inventor, Wolfgang von Kempelen. And then more bizarre occurrence was in Final Fantasy VII, which was a PlayStation game. And it takes place on a fictional magical planet. And here the Turks are not actually even an ethnic group. They're just the name of an organization that the player fights against. So, and in this like funny scene, the Turks have like this conversation about how hard it is their job, but that, you know, like they have to do it. And then all in all, they're happy about it and stuff like that. So like, which kind of like set the tone, strangely enough to my entire artistic career and my body of work to evolve. And so in one piece, I was like something that I did in grad school, back in Cal Arts in 2005 was Fantastic Turks. And it was in response to this bizarre appropriation of the terrible Turk trope. I unpacked the social function of the stock character through role-playing game. I dressed up like the in-game characters all in all black suits, leather gloves, combat boots, and black sunglasses. And I went and stood out in the Hollywood Boulevard and lured um, passerbys to recruit them into this organization called the Turks. But before I could admit them, I, the, the website tested them for their capacity for terribleness. And this was actually through play. It started to deconstruct the function and the purpose. And ultimately, it asked the question, and here is it would help if I could see my own slide. What is the purpose of 
a stereotype, a repeating trope, what purpose does it serve? At some point, I started turning inward. I was, you know, trying to figure out this identity and things, but then, you know, I started looking back home, what was happening? And I'm pretty sure everyone knows this guy was happening. It's almost like the trope became a real person and decided to become president. And so people, of course, started protesting. This is something in 2007 from our hometown in Izmir. And it's a city of 3 million people. And from calculations from aerial photography, they believe about 3 million people showed up to this protest. And all people did was pull flags and sing songs. Another one, aerial photography of one in Istanbul. And these were sim simultaneous all over the country. And then again in 2013, except this time, as Vuslat also showed in her slides, it turned violent. All the peaceful protests, which started out in guitars and yoga and all of that, um, was met with extreme violence by the police. And, and then, then afterwards, people lost their capacity to protest. Um, a lot of these, like, Something that was really like standing out really bizarre was much like most authoritarian regimes, a lot of the control was always done through first the control of women's bodies and erasure of women from society. And regardless of what religion or if it's a religious authoritarian regime, doesn't matter, like somehow female body serves as a battleground for control. So for the Turkish case, this started being, the conversation started revolving around covering women, which in the Turkish word kapatmak literally translates as to enclose or to shut down. Also like those, those things also mean the same thing. So, but this covering of course came and started being about women's hairs, so like hair became a symbol of this, um, shutting down and closing or covering. And of course, like as much as I said that it lost, made people lose their capacity to protest, which people instead started um, doing festivals and organizations and fun and playful things uh, to protest instead of actual like protest. So in this one, women wore their like nice fancy dresses, you know, put flowers in their hairs and wore big hats and rode their bicycles around the city for whole day being being visible and being there and you know letting their hair free. And so this got me thinking like, well, what about hair though? What is it about hair? And maybe some of you remember, I had these actually at Evergreen, these were exhibited. I did this series of work which was called Hair is a Woman's Glory. And it tries to understand the symbol and it tries to understand censorship. And it's done through this like scripture, like this calligraphy that is associated with religion traditionally, but it's actually also a throwback to a Joseph Kosuth piece, which is about um, a chair, one in three chairs, which is the chair itself, a picture of chair and a de dictionary definition of the chair. So I tried to do the same thing, looking at a lot of the censorship around female hair. So like, like, so if you censor it, what if you replace it with text? And what if this text just said hair, 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 hair in Turkish all over? Um, so all of those ideas, just to just question. And, and I also knew that somehow the conversation would always come and boil down to this um, false dichotomy of East versus West. So I lifted uh, a line from the Bible that said, hair is a woman's glory, which actually also talks about controlling women through their hair. So while doing all this, um, of course I was, practicing my hand in calligraphy, doodling around. These were works that were digital. I took a picture of myself, 
and I um, Photoshop my hair out. And then I started doodling and looking at a lot of calligraphy. And one of the pieces, and I was looking at a lot of stuff like this. For example, this one is a um, calligraphy work that says Buddha Gechar Yahu, this too shall pass. That's, that's what it means. I mean, it's, it's something that people hang in their homes to talk about, you know, like to give them hope about tr um, troubling times, but it's also designed to also kind of humble you down because if you're having happy times too, that you have to be mindful that it's your job to protect. And so doodling these things, um, I was looking at a rug on the floor, which has a lot of so Turkish rug, so kilim. It has these motifs and all of them mean different things. So while thinking about this project, I started on the side doodling and playing with my brush head, the digital thing. I spaced it apart and pulled it together. And this um, traditional calligraphy is called a hut, which is a line. So it's a line art in addition to it being like calligraphy. Um, so then this, I started doing these things like doodling, taking each individual symbol. And, and the reason why it's called I want to live forever is because it, um, in the carpet, when women weave these symbols together, and it's a, actually a practice that was traditionally pra um, women's craft, they would put motifs in there to somehow narrate a story of their family or their own life and hand it down from generation to generation. And so depending on the arrangement and how it's used and what's done, it somehow you get an idea, like somebody's married, they have a child or they have three children and they move they, um, the, from one place or they have famine, something like that, you know, some, some things that are similar. But one of them was this uh, hairband motif that was that symbolize happiness and joy and the celebration. And, but if you, if the woman used strands of her own hair and weaved it into the carpet, then that, some, that meant that she wanted eternal life. And I didn't quite understand at the time. And I, I don't know if I ever actually still do, but um, something about this duality in Turkish arts is that there's always like this, um, symmetry and duality and double meaning like you know sad times will pass but soul happiness happiness will, will not last it means that a celebration could also mean sorrow and if somebody wants to live forever that means that they're probably grieving over something some loss so I kept doing this and this started becoming my work it I, I made a dramatic turn in my career that you know it was a I mean, installations and digital work and performance and all these things. And all of a sudden, this is where I found myself. And I continued doing that. So this is another work. This was the second one. And then this is uh, number three, which is the, the waterway path, path, passage, playing with that motif. Then here's this motif, and this is the eye. And it's used as a talisman to protect for protection. And you see it a lot on kilims. Then I did this painting. Then I started somehow also making my own motifs. So I was like, okay, well, I got the freedom to do whatever I want. These are my paintings. So then I started thinking like, why am I even painting this way? What's going on? And earlier I was actually, and I'm gonna go back a slide. This is number two. This is the second painting that I have ever done. And by the time I reach number, well, actually I was here. This is very, very dark blue on beige ground. And I started typing into Google, trying to find if other painters are doing similar things. And um, I found Li Yufan's painting from 1973. And actually I didn't know about this. so. Kind of embarrassed to even say this, but it was, um, I guess, until 2016, not a lot of people in West knew about it. It's called Dan Saikwa Movement, monochrome painting, where um, post-war Korean painters who were so traumatized by the Korean War 
and the country splitting and tearing into two and families fighting each other through ideological wars that they decide that you know they had this existential moment where they they looked it was that well i'm going to say it, the existential oh shit moment of what's happening what's going on to us and where did we come from and where are we going and so that was when their work also took this dramatic turn for abstraction and minimalism and 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 then to just play with their own cultural heritage and to play with things that previous generations have like their ancestors creativity and take from them and like freely recreate and make their own and share it and and I was actually like okay I guess that's what's happening with my work that's why I am here today and that's it Thank you. And now our final panelist, um, Charles Edward Williams, who's unfortunately unable to be here in person, so he submitted a pre-recorded um, pre-recorded video for you that we will play. Thank you. Visual artist uh, from Georgetown, South Carolina. And I paint, I make video, I uh, sculpt. I do photography, I collage. And so us coming together <clears throat> today, I think is a very beautiful moment. It's actually um, something that is needed um, in the art world. And I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity to um, work with, I call it, I call them my crew uh, that are sitting um, before you, it's a really beautiful opportunity because what I have found is that as artists, we are very introspective. We're very, um, we, we look inside ourselves um, a lot. Um, and when we do that, we more often, like we, we isolate ourselves. Um, to to make the work. And I believe that as we continue to strive and achieve for our goals, towards our goals, um, to voice our opinions, the voice and sh to share our message, more and more isolation um, happens. And so, when I got when I got this uh, opportunity, this post collapse to. Um, create this series and body of work and to share my thoughts for what I think play means to me. It actually was, a, it was challenging um, in the beginning. And it was challenging because as a, I primarily paint, but it was challenging because the adult self was talking to my child self. And the adult self was literally thinking and questioning, um, you know, how to start or, you know, how I should position my paper or um, all these questions that can really inform our practice. But what I found is that the more and more the adult self was speaking uh, more boldly, more loudly than my child self. There was a frustration, there was a battle inside. And again, we you know these, these questions that I typically ask myself when in the studio, they're important questions. It I needed to eventually needed to um, sort of give, give my adult self a timeout I needed to put my adult self um, to to rest and really give myself the uh, patience, the um, understanding, the grace, 
um, and the acceptance for the moment in the studio to create. And so I began, I began to look at, well, what are the things that I don't use or that I have used before? What are those things that I'm curious about? And I started, I started playing with those. Um, and I, I'll, I started exploring with those more, so not playing, but I started exploring with those. And then I found myself um, going back into my childhood and just really imagining. Um, I thought, I think that the more that I continue to explore, my adult self kept wanting to wake up and, and you know, like check on my childlike self to say, okay, well, what are you, what are you doing? This is not, this is not normal. Right. And so, um, I actually, you know, started, um, excuse me, excuse me. This is live. And this is me waking up too. Um, I actually got an opportunity to go to, uh, to do a workshop, uh, back home, um, which is, Another reason why I'm here in South Carolina and to work with sixth graders. And during that time, during that time, I got a chance to see, you know, um, middle school or intermediate, you know, fourth, fifth and sixth graders play and imagine and talk and interact with one another. And that was the best thing that happened because for me, it showed me and gave me an idea, a template, it gave me um, an example for, and permission to let go and to not have questions asked and posed for, um, to inform our practice. And so having that example, you know, for five days, it helped me to go back into the studio and to paint. And so, you know, the series that I'm working on in regards to play um, is from my uh, swim series of me having my accidental drownings and me looking at the history and the exploration of how water has played an influence, um, you know, for me, but also in my personal life, but also um, in the historical context. And that that vulnerability that I was able to get, um, you know, from accepting those accidents and claiming them and embracing them and sharing them is the same process that I needed to go through in regards to this series play. And so it was beautiful that I had the example of the fourth, fifth and sixth graders. And so when I went back into the studio, um, because I get I did start, you know, um, using material that I haven't used and just sort of exploring it. But when I got back in the studio, it was like this burst of um, energy. It was about, it was this burst of um, honestly light. I, I really was not thinking. And so um, I started also listening to some of my old music that just made me happy that I used to listen to years ago. I mean, years ago, just that happy, feel-good music. And um, and so I started painting myself, you know, of the self-portraits and the floaties. I started painting myself and really pushing the aspects of freedom, of exploration, of play, joy, and happiness. And, um, you know, I think they came out very, very beautiful, but... I think it's important that from time to time as artists, we make sure that we put aside the, the routine of how we operate in the studio and explore, you know, within that process of, of exploration, you, you really can come up with your own value system. Um, I know when I, when you think, when you hear the term, system it sort of go against of the natural sense of like play and free like but but as you continue to explore and you sharpen those skills for doing things that are different and unexpected what happens is is that 
you're sharpening your mind, you're sharpening yourself, you're sharpening your values, your perception, you're sharpening all those things to then help you inform your art even more. Because the last thing that we want to do as artists, the last thing that we want to do is go into the studio and make work and, and it not speak, it not resonate, it not transcend, it not... Um, you know, surpass um, our lifetime. Like we want those things. We're born with those things, those those gifts to be able to have the capabilities to do that. But the last thing we want to do is not uh, achieve those things. And so it is very important that, um, you know, from one artist to another, you go into the studio and you explore and you make sure that you document that exploration you make sure that you give yourself the permission the freedom the liberty to express because at the end of the day it doesn't matter what subject it doesn't matter what subject that is important to you i mean in our social political climate we have so many um subjects that we can take and look at and explore and dissect and analyze and 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 have a dialogue with but it's i i think and believe that it's more important that that connection that if you like apples and you like apples passionately well, what are all the ways that you can explore your like your love for apples and how do you do that um and again i think you know from time to time, or as often as you can, if you're not asking yourself those questions in the beginning in your daily practice, start asking yourself those questions. And then after a while from sharpening those skills for asking yourself those questions, those various questions, well, why do you like apples? And what type of apples do you like? And what's the history of apples? And so once you sort of sharpen that, put that aside and see if you can create your passion for apples through your own intuitive spirit. And I think that's a different realm. I think it's a different realm that we as artists that we, and I say, and I include myself, we don't tap into enough, not to say that we haven't done it and we might've done it. We might've done it and we not even realize it, but I think we haven't done it enough because with all the artists that are out there in the world, our art that we create should be blowing people's minds. And I say people, those that who aren't creative, those who are looking for that fresh new perception, you know, perspective on how things could be and we've got that power of artists to show them what it could be we have that ability to transcend we have that ability to uncover we have that ability to excavate we have that ability to show why this is important why this is meaningful and why this is why we do what we do why we create um and the other thing is, is that how I was able to be amongst other children, students, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, that was so beautiful because it showed me that I needed, I needed to see that, to be amongst that, and to have that environment to then understand my own capabilities. And as artists, I mean, historically, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, the NUS, the Harlem Renaissance, or the Abstract Expressionists. I mean, these various groups, I, and I use those two as an example, but they they got together regularly, you know, all the time. Um, you know, Abstract Expressionists, they created a school, you know, down in Asheville, Black Mountain College. I mean, they got together, and when they got together, they created their own world. They created something powerful. They created something that was unlike any other 
and it's in the history books and so and and we have um, read about them today and so it's so that's one aspect of why it's important to come together and another reason is that what it can do is it can help you reestablish and reimagine it can also help you evolve it can also help you grow within your artistic practice it can help you even transform deeper into connecting with people who see your work because I, human human nature we want to we want to see goodness we want freshness and a lot of times in this you know in our social political climate it's about me 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 it's about independent but i think that the beautiful thing and the ability that humans have is to show is the hope and that hope comes from when we come together when you see kids playing naturally it's such a beautiful natural organic thing it's a, it's a wholesome thing to that but how often do we see adults come together you know, we have these different groups in social, in our uh, social, you know, climate. But at the end of the day, we're all saying the same thing. And that is that we just want to be heard. We want to be accepted. We want to be validated. And so us as artists, it is our job to show this is the world that we can create for everybody. We are embracing the fact that we may not see like one another. And there might be one creative that makes film. There might be another creative that makes collages. They may not, they might be another creative that paints. But the three creatives coming together can show hope, can be an example for reciprocity, can be an example for forgiveness and all these other emotional things that when you're pulled away and separated, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It only divides. So the more we sharpen our skills creatively, it helps us then be able to go out into the world and show how we can be together. And I think that's the hope that everyone's looking for. And it is within that hope that we feel accepted. Because there's something chemically that happens like when we see kids coming together playing. And it's like, oh, they're so cute. You know, we we like that. But as adults, we sometimes like, okay, we shy away from that because of what we're being brainwashed. So I'm blessed and I'm fortunate, like I said before, to come together and work with my crew and uh post collapse and um and it's going to be this it's going to be an exciting time for us and and we're going to show what it looks like to come together and how fun we're having um and make history so again thank you for um giving me the opportunity to sit and um chat with you um over zoom and to be a part of this and again very honored um forgive me for not uh being there but um feel free to reach out anytime again my name is charles charles edward williams and um i'm very excited for this so more to come play 2023 bye Thank you, everyone. There's like a big round of applause from our um, audience. And um, it's wonderful to hear all of the um, expressions of what is considered kind of play and practices. And I loved what you said earlier. I think it was, was it Vuslat or I can't remember, it was you or uh, Ilkner about um, the idea that within celebration, there's also sorrow that these things are. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that that when we think of things simplistically as one thing, um, that 
we don't we doesn't stick but when we understand them to be multi faceted that um that they resonate for us in deeper ways and to remember about to remember play but in context of all of these things that you have brought up um so i want to just uh point out that people we would invite everybody to raise their hand for uh comments and questions so that you can interact with the people up here um these panelists and um and there are a couple of things in the in the q a but it's it's so much nicer to hear voices and have the the dialogue um so can you see these Vuslat? do you want to run this as a kind of panel discussion oh, i can definitely i know there are a um, couple of questions for kiani um, so when you were in, in the beginning of your discussion, when you said uh, you're unhappy with some terms and trying to find one, uh, we, have, we have one comment from Catherine Straley, would the term sociologist better describe your travels? And we have one more um, question from Adrian Greenway, who asks, where can we see your films? So maybe you could respond to, to both. Cool, cool. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, and a beautiful thing about doing these these talks is that it, it helps me to kind of identify myself a little bit. And I'll just say, I don't think sociologist is appropriate either. Um, only because, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just living amongst people and I found a place that I want to live. I'm an artist. That's actually the best way to describe me. I'm an artist. I'm just some dude. I found a place that really works for me in terms of where I want to spend most of my time and, and a place that I want to, uh, exude my creative energy. Um, that happens to be in Suriname, and I'm very blessed that I'm able to make that happen um, because there's no direct correlation between Suriname and where I grew up in the United States, you know? So, and the last thing I'll say on that is that set and setting is so important. And sometimes set and setting, first of all, is the three feet in front of you, and then it extends beyond. And I've been able, allowed, given permission in some higher level and some other realm, as Charles liked to say, or as Charles said in his presentation, that allows me to be here in Cerna to create. Uh, but I'm also confident that if for some reason I were to get banned from this country or they, they close the borders, that I'd find another place to operate. But for now, just I really love Cerna. And to answer the second question, um, I am working with a distribution company. And we uh, one of my films, A Posse for Romeo, the, the longer documentary, will be streaming towards the end of 2023. And I think, um, and I haven't shared this with uh, Vuslat yet, but maybe we're gonna add a streaming component to MPAC uh, for some of my other work. Yeah, so I'm happy everyone was here for the announcement of uh, MPAC streaming. Great, so that, that answers that question, I think, yeah. Thank you so much. That would be amazing. Yes, Impact does have the conversation series with artists, um, but the streaming component would be amazing. And I know Charles also um, would like to have a component where we do panel discussions. Um, we have a question from Trey. Yeah, so I have uh, two questions. One for, oh God, I hope I don't mess up your name. In corner, or I'm so sorry. Uh, but I was looking at, I love your art pieces a lot. And I was wondering if you um, sell prints at all, or like, uh, I'm total makes total sense if you don't want to do that either, but they're just really gorgeous. And then I was thinking of how you guys find the balance between like contemplating on your own work and like working together and that kind of stuff. I can, my habit is being an introvert and I have to make myself go out. So yeah, thank you so much for everything. Um, so I haven't yet made anything available for prints yet, but I have been thinking about it. And, um, but, you know, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Don't know what to do with that thought. Um, because the way that I make these things is, it starts out as digital sketches, which then I project like the old school masters would, you know, like to a bigger, I want to, like I put a big piece or a small and I hand trace, then I recreate these manually. And 
some things get lost during that recreation. And I, I like that because when they're perfectly symmetrical, my software allows me to draw one half the picture and the other part doubles and it's just perfect symmetry. And then when I redo these by hand, they become a little bit more like creature patterns, whereas they're symmetry, but not exactly perfect, like wings of a butterfly. You know, there's something more organic that happens because, because of my flawed human self, self, you know? And so that's in there. So then I was like, these could be prints, but conceptually, what does that mean? You know, when then I then mechanically or digitally reproduce these once again. So I'm grappling with that. And that's honestly the reason. Um, and the other question was about being introvert. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> My sister sometimes teases. Okay, so yeah, she used to tease me about being like feral cat. <laughs> um, so it's it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I try to. Um, I have to literally have to make myself go and post on Instagram. I'm even like, I'm shy to even do that. Like it's, it's a task. I overthink it. Making a single post takes me like half an hour to 45 minutes. And I, then I edit it like a billion times after I post it. Cause I'm like, Oh, I sound like an idiot, you know, like, so yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I have no advice about that. I want to also say that um, this exhibition, so, um, okay, so a little bit of a background. So when we did the 1989 exhibition in response to the open call, Kiani submitted some work and we were just blown away. And of course, we wanted to work with Kiani right away. And for the exhibition that got picked up by curator um, James McDevitt and Cerritos, we also had Charles's work in there. So the 1989 exhibition became larger. And somehow we connected so well, of course, with all of the artists, but especially, you know, Kiani and Charles, and we continued our meetings, brainstorming. And in one of those meetings, which is more like friends getting together to talk over Zoom, we started, you know, naturally brainstorming, coming up with some ideas here and there, and then sort of stumbled upon play. And I think it was Charles who blurted the name, like, let's call it play, right? Mm -hmm. So, and so, um, we wrote up a proposal. We all wrote your project proposals for, for class. We wrote our project proposal too, and we submitted a grant. Hopefully we get that grant. Uh, but one way or another, we said, all right, instead of waiting for the opportunities and wait, and instead of, you know, working around the questions of explaining your fit, explaining your work, justifying your context, right? Like, educating public about who you are, what you do, why it matters. Let's just do it. Let's just get together. So we have the space. We have each other. We trust our work. We trust each other. Um, so one way or another, we decided to do what, you know, like Charles said, the old schools do, Black Mountain College, the other playhouses, and kind of really open it up for a space of creative exploration. And that's how play happened. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, I don't know if I'm an introvert, but I definitely suffer from imposter syndrome, which I think is probably on par with, with that. Um, yeah, look, you just have to eventually have confidence in yourself. And I went through a little something in Trinidad where like the imposter syndrome was so great that I was ready to quit the residency. No one was putting pressure on me, but I was ready to quit the residency. I, I was just like, I don't know that I'm even an artist. But then I got out of my head for a minute and I opened my eyes and I looked at my studio and the whole studio is covered in wire and wire sculptures. And, you know, so sometimes it's just opening your eyes and sometimes it's just taking a breath. Sometimes it's sleeping on it, you know. Um, but look, if you're creating, you're creating. And as far as impact, impact for me was something that brought on some imposter syndrome. But now it's like, wow, this is family. These are friends. These are people who have my best interest in mind, you know, and so overcoming trust issues and, and all that jazz from my past. Um, MPAC and, and curators are so important because often as artists, we, we struggle with all these things, putting ourselves out there. So yeah, um, you know, I couldn't do it without them. And that's, yeah, my two cents on the, on the subject.
Thank you. And I, and I don't know if you all see the, the Q&A here. Um, some encouragement from Trey. Thank you so much. <laughs> and definitely we're open to ideas and collaboration and sharing. So re stay in touch, reach out. And a question from Lena for Iknur. Thank you for sharing some history around the Kilim motifs. I'm a weaver and it was very cool to hear the hair and magic I weave into my work is connected to an historical instinct. I'm interested in how it feels to work tradition and history into your work on an emotional or spiritual level. This is a really, really good question. And um, I'm every day I'm like thinking about this actually, like what am I really doing? And this is one of the reasons why I really, I was, I was in love instantly when I discovered the post-war Korean artist. And one of the things they said was that their minimalism was like what, what differentiates the Korean and Japanese, you know, Japan went through Hiroshima and Korea to this day is split. Um, and their minimalism, unlike Western minimalism in Europe and that evolved out of, of course, another tragedy, but Western minimalism was a rejection of everything that was like the tradition, rejection of um, how Europe got there, how Europe became, came to that uh, destructive moment in history. Whereas Koreans describe and Japanese describe it as a total embrace where they go back to their culture and give it love. And it's almost like, kind of like what Charles was saying is it's, it's like that telling your inner child, hey, it's gonna be all right. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna make it. And, and in order to make it through these very difficult times, you have to give yourself love to survive. And it's, you know, it's kind of going back to those like, give peace a chance kind of a thing but you know like it seems like humanity we've just been circling and circling and circling trying to co you know convince people to give peace a chance but and that's where I think um about what I'm doing in this practice is I'm learning from the past but in a way to make sure that there is a future that's how I feel about it. Thank you. And I, I'm not sure if I'm getting all the questions, if I have missed anything. Um, Trey has a question for Kiani. Um, he says, uh, I'm full of joy and inspiration. Your grapple with imposter syndrome is really helpful as well, even though I draw all the time. It can be hard to really feel the statues, especially since I dislike pedestals. But yeah, this is great. So being might be better. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and a couple of, I'm sorry if I'm missing anything. Um, Saz has a question. Saz has a question. Thank you. I actually just had another kind of quick comment for Kiani, kind of off the uh, cuff of uh, what he just spoke about and what Trey was referencing. Um, uh, and I debated whether or not I was going to share this with you, but um, hearing you talk about imposter syndrome is just so interesting because uh, I was one of the students uh, in one of uh, Professor Katsanis's previous programs that got to see a posse Fu Romeo and talk to you and ask you questions about it. and. Uh, I remember I asked you then, like as a, an independent filmmaker, like if you ever had the experience of like 
uh, having a scene in mind that's like very technical and you know whatever and you get there on the day and it's like it's just not going to work and if you have what do you do and I don't even remember exactly what you said but just hearing you talk through that experience was so inspiring and insightful and cool for me as an independent filmmaker myself and then in the next quarter uh, with Professor Katsanis I was I was making my own film and I, I had that that same you know, imposter syndrome of like getting there on the day and being like, this is, this is just not going to work. I can't do this. Uh, but if I hadn't had that conversation with you, I, I would have spiraled into that imposter syndrome. But, but having that moment with you, I feel like is, is, I mean, it is, it's what got me through it. And so, yeah, that just, you, you've had such an impact on me as an independent filmmaker as well. And you're just a huge role model and inspiration. So yeah, definitely not an imposter. Keanu is not the imposter. Don't eject him. Don't eject him, guys. Hey, thank you so much. That that is right up there. That takes the cake. That's the new greatest uh, compliment I've ever received so far on this creative journey. Um, thank you so much for that. Yeah, and again, that's what this is all about. You know, I'm not an influencer, but I do try to just be honest. You know what I mean? That's it. That's all you can do. So keep going and, you know, no matter what problem you encounter at the end of the day, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity to be creative. That's the way I look at it. So thank you again. That was beautiful. Thank you. That's a great way to end our time. Thank you, Kenny. That's a lovely way um, to think about going forward. Um, so I want to thank all of you, Vuslat, especially for bringing all these great people to the art lecture series and um, for this lovely um, array of practices um, and thinking. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Thank you for, for thank allowing you. us to present the last ALS of the year. I'm a huge fan and I am very honored. Thank you, Shaw and Kathleen and everyone and Saz and all the students. So.